So we made it back for another week. I am almost done with the exams. We just had a couple of technical hiccups that kind of delayed some things here and there. Uh, we'll be having another quiz soon, but first I'm going to be giving you guys kind of just a practice assignment just to kind of get the technical hitches out of the way, just to kind of show you guys how we're going to get things set up and all that stuff. So quizzes and exams are going to be pushed completely online at this point because if you look around you, people are not here, right? So um, I'm going to probably be updating these, not probably, I will be updating the syllabus also um, just to kind of reflect some of the changes that have happened uh, through the semester and the things that the, that the university uh, is asking us to kind of, uh, let's say, deal with. And so I'll post that there. So I'm really just saying this, keep an eye out on Canvas and for the announcements and the stuff that's going to be coming through there just so you guys are aware of the changes that happen is what it is. Okay. Anyway, uh, we finished up Chapter 6. We learned basically two important topics in Chapter 6. That was uh, the, let's say, the energy levels of, the, um, of an atom and its orbitals. We figured out a way how to calculate those using basically just one equation. Um, and then we kind of related back to the idea of how the periodic table is assembled and how the electrons fill in. All right, we learned about electron configurations. And we ended with the idea of Lewis structures. Okay, Lewis structures. And what we're going to do is now that we know where the electrons are and we know where the electrons live, uh, what we're going to do is kind of say, all right, well, what kind of trends do we see in the periodic table itself, right? And we're going to then take that and tie it into chapters eight and nine, which I kind of crammed together into one uh, giant, uh, giant lecture series there. And then once we, once we kind of figure out the trends of things, then we're going to build molecules and apply those trends to the molecules themselves. Okay? So eight and nine are going to come together, although some of chapter 11 is also going to be in chapters eight and nine, just because I don't know, I don't know why this book broke things apart in the way they did, but uh, chapter 11, the parts that we need to cover at least, will fit into here. And so when you guys are asked, uh, in the spring semester, hey, did you guys cover chapter 11? Your answer is going to be yeah. yes, at least the parts that we care about. There are parts of chapter 11 that we don't care about. Um, and like I said, I'll try to clarify that when we, when we get into that, okay? But anyway, so the, the name of the game, just to paint a big picture here, is take the electrons, look at the trends, put those electrons together to make molecules, and then look at those trends also. That's kind of what it is, okay? So we're going to be living quite a bit in the conceptual side of things, uh, which makes this upcoming exam and the stuff a little bit more challenging also, just because we've been dealing a lot with the math lately, right? Basically chapters one through six, uh, excuse me, one through the beginning part of six were all math based, and now we're going into kind of the concept thing, which some of you guys like better, but it's also a little bit of a change here from the way things are, okay? Cool. So before we uh, kind of uh, get too far deep into the weeds, uh, let's get started with prayer then, and uh, then we'll launch, and we'll launch right into it. Um, but Lord, we just thank you yet again for another day and another week, and just a, another undeserved blessing, Lord. Uh, we know that each day is a gift from you, and uh, Lord, we just pray that we know how to humble ourselves before you, Lord, and just be able to accept this gift and to appreciate this gift for what it is, Lord, for each day the blessing that it is. Uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, we use this gift for your glory and for your sake, and uh, whatever it is that you'd have us do today, Lord, whatever it is that you'd have us say, whatever it is that we accomplish, Lord, we pray that we, we put you first and that we try to do these through the lens of looking at you and your example that you set for us, Lord. We just pray that you give us the strength, the knowledge, and the courage just to step forward in our faith and take that step towards you. And we just pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, chapters 7, 8, and 9 are, are probably my three favorite um, and I just want to kind of start this off, uh, maybe a little bit of a story that some of you guys have already heard, and I can't remember if I told this class or not already. But um, when I, when I, not too long ago, in the grand scheme of things, when I was kind of sitting in the chairs uh, that you guys are, and you know, I was my freshman year, it was my, I was honestly my first class also, um, although I've always been a morning person, so 8 a.m. is 
not a problem. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so uh, when I was sitting in general chemistry, I had a fantastic professor. Her name was uh, Dr. Kay Sandberg. And um, I didn't know her at the time. Um, but, you know, I sat down there. She was very, very strict. I had set high expectations. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, this class is, this class is going to be something else. The last time I had had chemistry at that point was in 10th grade. And uh, I couldn't have cared less about it at that point. And that trend kind of continued through general chemistry. At the end of Gen Chem 1 and 2, I said, what the, what, what's the point? <laughs> it's just a bunch of equations I string together. And then I have to like point at a periodic table and count some numbers and all this kind of stuff. I wasn't a huge fan, is what it comes down to. And uh, in case you guys needed to know that God has a sense of humor, now I'm a chemist, right? So <laughs> life always, life always uh, has a way of working things out. But uh, I didn't really appreciate general chemistry. But uh, just to kind of put a put a bow on this story here, um, I just we the, the the research group that we that, that we work with here, uh, we just finished writing a nice paper that deals with these exact concepts that we're talking about in here, right? We're making brand new things that nobody's made before. And we're analyzing them using the techniques that I'm teaching you guys. And I say this just in the sense of what, what happens with chemistry is that it builds on itself. What you do for the first two years is we lay a very heavy foundation for you guys with general chemistry and organic chemistry. And it's not until you kind of get to the upper division where the stuff starts to coalesce together and we really start to see the fruits of all the efforts that you guys have been putting into there. So, I say that just to stick with it. I promise that the stuff that I'm teaching you guys, over the many years that I've been doing this, I've you know, kind of narrowed this down to the extremely important ideas that are relevant, that you guys will use, that you will see, no matter really the field that you guys end up with, okay? It's there, it's kind of hard to see at the beginning here, but I promise it's coming to is what I say. So that is what I just want to mention. These are my kind of my favorite chapters here. They're very, very, very important, especially for when you get to no, nope, this is organic chemistry, right? Most of the stuff that we're dealing with here is going to be organic chemistry, okay? So we will see it over and over and over and over and over. So if you guys want to do yourself a favor and get yourself a head start in organic chemistry, these are going to be three of the most important chapters uh, to kind of deal with, seven, eight, and nine, okay? All right. So what we're going to do first is kind of look at the periodic table and see what other information we can get out of it. And the first thing is this idea of uh, atomic radii. Now... When I'm done with chapter seven, I'm gonna take all these, if I can wait till the end of chapter seven, and all the concepts I'm gonna deal with from this idea of periodic trends is gonna to relate to the radius of the atoms themselves. So what in the world are we even talking about when we talk about an atomic radius? Right, what are we really measuring? Yeah. The, the distance from the nucleus to the farthest Mm -hmm. What makes up most of an atom? Yeah. Nothing, right? I think there's the, uh, I might have already shared this with you guys at some point, but one of the classic visualizations is that, um, if, I get, if, I, if I remember it properly, if you put a nucleus represented by a quarter in the middle of a football field at the 50 yard line, the first electron is gonna show up somewhere in the end zone, okay? Everything in between is just empty space, all right? Most of an atom is empty space. So when we're talking about the atomic radius, we're really just measuring from the center of the nucleus out to the furthest most electron. A lot of that is just represented by empty space. And um, uh, if any of you guys have know Chuck Missler, he's a, uh, he's a pastor, just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientist who ties science in with, the, uh, with scripture. Very, very, I mean, just, this guy's amazing. <laughs> I don't know how he knows as much as he does. But he makes a, in one of his uh, sermons that he gives to his uh, church, yeah, I know, a church sermon, right? He, he talks about that, you know, the world is basically made up of nothingness, right? This empty space, right? When you guys are putting your hand on your desk, right? When you guys are holding your pencil or your pen, you're, you're touching empty space for the most part, right? I mean, it's something just kind of crazy to think about, right? But that's, that's what it is, right? Yep. I'm sorry, Mr. What the atomic radius is that? You said between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. Oh. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, anyway, radius is going to be important for us, and let's see if we can start to tie this together. So, um, if I'm the nucleus of this classroom, okay, 
and you guys are my electrons. Right? We're a little one-sided. Mm -hmm. We're a little one-sided. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a visualization. It's like, no, it's all wrong. We have to surround them. <laughs> so if I'm the nucleus and you guys are the electrons, right? You guys are existing in defined orbitals, so to speak, right? You guys are in rows, right? All these kind of things, right? If, uh, uh, let's say that uh, one of you guys in the front here wants to get up and leave. You're like, screw this. I'm, I'm way too tired. It's a Monday. It's 8 a.m. I don't want to be here. Right? If, if one of you guys get up and wants to leave, it's going to be fairly noticeable for me, right? And I'll mock you and it'll be recorded and it'll be so embarrassing and people make comments and tens of people will see it. <laughs> so, if one of you guys in the back decide to get up and leave, right, I might not notice because it's a little bit further away from me, right? And this visualization held itself a little bit better when I was teaching in a classroom of 300 because I didn't know anybody in the back, right? They were the ones that were always watching, you know, Netflix and stuff while coming to class. Mm -hmm. I didn't take attendance, you know. <laughs> Just stay home and watch Netflix and it's all good, right? But the point being, the closer an electron is to the nucleus, it's going to feel the effect of that nucleus, okay? But you guys already knew that, right? Because what charge does an electron have? And what charge is the nucleus? What happens when you put negatives and positives? They're going to be what? Attracted to each other, right? So the closer you are to the nucleus, the more attraction there is between the electron and the nucleus. And that's going to be important for all these principles that are going to be coming up. That's why I want you guys to start to think about this. How close or how far is it to the nucleus? And that's going to kind of really answer all these things. I could stop it here and just say, okay, time to move on to chapter 8 and 9. Right, and if you guys really understand that idea there, then that's really all there is to it. Okay? But anyway, um, just a couple of things we, um, uh, when we're dealing with here, why it's important. Remember, we are dealing, or we will start to talk about bond length, and we've already talked a little bit about bond strength, right? When we're talking about the making or the breaking of bonds, and that's going to be affected by the radius itself. Okay? If you have larger atomic radii for the atoms that you're bonding together, it should make sense then that you're going to have longer bond lengths. Right? So if you imagine you put two basketballs next to each other versus two golf balls next to each other, right? which one of those is going to have a longer length in between them? There? Well, it's just going to be a function of the radius for either one of them is what it is. Right? And that seems to make logical sense. Right? Cool. Uh, here's a uh, periodic table of skills, right? But really what we're showing here is the trend for atomic radius, okay? The trend for atomic radius. Now I put Why the answers up. Why do the noble up. gases hate you? Hmm? Why do the noble gases hate you? Mike? What do you mean they hate you? They're all on the same side. Mmm, interesting, right? Mm, there must be something else going on here, then, right? Must be something else going on here. Now, I already. That's true. Yeah, the noble gases. And neon's like, why do they not the same size anymore? No, they're like, they're they're definitely increasing in size, but they're a lot bigger than the atoms next to them. Oh, you're talking about the bigger than the. Yeah, like the halogens are tiny. So, up at the top middle there, I kind of give you guys stuff to pay attention to, right? Size decreases as you go from left to right. And what you notice with our buddy fluorine there is just a little, little tiny speck. It's an extremely small atom, right? Extremely small atom. Now, uh, we're not going to deal with it as much in here, but especially when we get to organic chemistry, we'll find that fluorine, because of that small radius, it has some pretty unique properties associated with it. But again, this is something you guys already knew, right? Like, yeah, of course we did, Dr. H. We know all about fluorine. I woke up this morning thinking about it. <laughs> but anyway, so from... Hmm? It's extremely reactive, right? It depends, right? It depends. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Now, fluorine as a gas, it certainly is. But once it's bound to certain things, it's just going to kind of sit there like a lump, right? But it decreases from left to right, and as you guys were kind of uh, commenting earlier, its size increases as you go from top 
to bottom, right? So we see the general trend is things get bigger as you go from top to bottom, and things get smaller as you go left to right, okay? Couple of oddities down here, you see our lanthanides and actinides pretty much stay the same, okay? Not too much variation with the lanthanides and actinides. So I could never really ask you as a question, uh, what's bigger, samarium or europium? I'm like, I don't really know myself either. I'd have to go look it up, okay? And in general, especially if you kind of look here in the middle of the, uh, the D block of your transition metals, you'll see your transition metals kind of don't really have a noticeable trend either, okay? They're kind of roughly the same size. There are some variations, right, if you go from yttrium to cadmium, that kind of thing, right? But in general, the, trans the your transition metals kind of are about the same size, okay? But if you think about it, right, if you look at cesium all the way down here, fluorine all the way at the top there, right, very, very, very different atomic reagents. And that's going to be important. This is also going to help start to explain a little bit, at least, about why the solubility rules are the way they are, okay? If you guys remember when we talked about solubility rules, it was what, a couple weeks ago at this point, right, three weeks ago, something like that? We talked about that there were certain exceptions with barium and all these kind of things in there, right? We can relate this all back to the idea of atomic radius, okay? And so we, there is a theory which we don't talk about in this course, and actually one of our inorganic courses, which deals with hard soft acid base theory, and that's kind of dependent on the, uh, what we'll call the scientific squishiness of, it, of, it, of an atom itself, okay? which is dependent on the radius. Polarizability is what we would call it. Okay? All right, so atomic radius increases down a group, atomic radius decreases um, across a period, right? And just to kind of put some thoughts into bullet points here, remember as you go from left to right across a period, right? So a period left to right, okay? Electrons are added into the same shell, but it doesn't increase size, okay? So if you think about it, right, if we go from carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, right, we're adding electrons into our P subshell there, right? 2P1, 2P2, 2P3, yada, 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 you guys got it. But we actually don't de increase in size. Why would it make sense that we increase in size, though? New cells? Well, we're in the same shell, but think about this, right? If I add an electron, Logic would say that I increase in size. More attraction. Why would that be? Hmm? More attraction. What's more attraction? I'm just saying I'm adding an electron, right? Okay. Yeah. Would it be towards the opposite? Because you have electrons there and you added another one, so it's more charged, so it wants to be further away from the other one? Yeah, right? If you guys think about this, we start to cram more students into this classroom. Okay, so imagine another student walks in. Where are they gonna sit? Are they gonna sit right here? I can 100% guarantee you they won't. Why? Because it's in the front row, and also it's what? It's around other people, right? They're gonna go find a nice empty spot probably in the back row there, okay? That's the same thing with electrons. Remember electrons, we always fill in on the back row of the auditorium if you wanna think about it like that, right? And so as you add electrons into this, remember you're adding another negative. And what happens when you put negatives together? They'll do what? Ripples. Repel each other, okay? And if we're talking about repelling each other, that means they're going to want to take up more space. And if these want to take up more space, that means they should increase the radius. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now that's gonna be another important thought, so hang on to that for just a little bit but we actually see the opposite happen, where we add an electron and things actually go down in size. And so remember, we're also adding a proton as we go left to right. So it just so happens that by adding a proton and an electron as we move up our periodic table, that increase in attraction between that proton and the electron, let's say, pulls everything in tighter more than the electrons repel each other, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a jump from the noble gases to the alkali metals. Remember, your alkali metals are your group one, right? And remember, as you go from noble gas to your group one, we're increasing our N, our principal quantum number. 
And remember, every time you increase n, what happens? You get bigger orbitals, right? But then things start to shrink again. So this is what I'm trying to show you guys here. As you add electrons, there's repulsion between the things next to it and the things behind, uh, uh, in front of it. But the attraction to the nucleus kind of outweighs that is what it is. Okay. Draw things in closer. So we mentioned this a bit, right? But just to kind of zoom in on it for just a second. Um, when we're dealing with the transition metals, really there's, you know, they're kind of uh, constant, right? In fact, there's some, uh, you know, there's even some uh, trends going the opposite direction of what we might expect. But the, um, the S orbital kind of determines the size in general here. There's, it gets a little bit more complex. I'm not trying to hedge anything here. I'm not trying to point at anything that you guys are expected to know. Um, aside from we are really simplifying this idea, okay? Remember what I always said is I would lie to your guys' faces, right? But I always tell you when I'm lying to your faces, and what we're doing here is the, the very important lie of omission, if we wanna say that, okay? There's a rhyme and the reason why things behave the way they do, and it's a fascinating reason, and it explains a lot of phenomena, but I've gotta build this foundation that I was talking about earlier for you guys. So what I want you guys to focus on now is just this idea of how the electrons repel each other and how they're attracted to the nucleus itself, okay? And as we go from left to right, we decrease the radius, okay? Transition metals are just kind of an aberration at this point. Okay, so let's take a idea here for just a second then, right? Now that we know everything that we need to know <laughs> about atomic radius, right? Now let's take a look at ionic radius, right? Ionic radius. All right, so let's think about this. Here's my statement. Cations are smaller than their neutral atoms, okay? Cations are smaller than their, than their neutral atoms. Yep? Doesn't that kind of contradict the whole thing you said about how more, oh, never mind. Because the electrons are away. Yeah, I'm stupid. Okay, never mind. I wouldn't say you're stupid. <laughs> I'd say it's early though, right? <laughs> and it's been a real... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Late nights at the club, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so does it make sense that a cation is going to be smaller than the neutral atom? Yes. Why would that make sense? Now what's a cation? A cation is when I do what? Positive. Take an electron away from something, right? If I take an electron away, what am I reducing? The number of electrons. The number of electrons and what? Charge. What do you mean by charge? Um. <laughs> if I take electrons away, right? Which factor am I helping you get rid of? I'm decreasing the repulsion. Right? I'm decreasing this repulsion, right? Which mean which means what? I take an electron away, the, neutral, the, the nucleus stays the same. So there's the same amount of positive to share between less of the negatives, right? It'd be like if I brought just one pizza in here for you guys, right? And I said, okay, uh, we've got, let's see, three, six, nine, 12, 15 of you guys here, right? And we've all got to share eight slices. We're gonna cut everything in half, so I get one, two, right? And a nice 16, there we go, right? And so everyone gets a nice little sliver, just enough to make everyone mad because it's not quite satisfying, right? But as we start to kick students out, right, then we each get a bigger slice of that same pie, right? Same idea here. So if I kick electrons out, there's more of the nucleus for them to be attracted to and less to repel from other electrons. Does that make sense? Can you guys guess what the next thing we're gonna talk about is? See, we talked about cations, right? So <laughs> we'll get there in just a second. So let's think about this for just a second then. As I kick electrons off, my ionic radius would get smaller. What happens if I continue to kick electrons off? So I go from a one plus to a two plus, to a three plus, 
to a four plus. What happens to the radius? It's gonna get what? Smaller and smaller and smaller, right? As those electrons get held closer to the nucleus. Now this is gonna lead us into another important idea where we're gonna talk about ionic uh, or ionization energy, okay? The ionization energy is gonna tell us how much energy it takes to kick that electron off, okay? And the closer you are to the nucleus, Right, the more energy it's going to take to kick that up. Okay, so just keep that in mind. It's all just based off of the radius. Okay, but the bigger the plus, the smaller the atom. All right. Just as you guys predicted, right? What about anions? Anions are going to be larger in radius, right, than their uh, neutral atom. We still have the same amount of pizza, but we start to add more students to the room. We have to cut the slices smaller and smaller and smaller, and everyone gets angrier, right? Start to repel each other, start to have to want to take up more space. Yeah? Um, but adding electrons does not increase size. Kind of like does not work. For elements. for elements only? Yeah. What do you mean? Adding electrons does not increase size. When you're dealing with neutral species, because when you add an electron, you also add a proton as you step up the periodic table, right? For ions, remember, you keep the protons constant, you just add or remove electrons. Yep. What do you think as you start to add more electrons? Well, as we go from one minus to two minus to three minus, et cetera, et cetera, what happens? It's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? More repulsion. So is there a factor of how much it gets larger? Like, if you add in, like, it goes to one minus, does it get bigger by a certain amount? Or is it dependent on the element? Or you say, is there some kind of defined trend where if add one electron, increase size by 1.2 or something? Um, not that I know of, right? But we will see kind of a graphical representation of this. And you'll see there is a trend per period, right? Per period, there will be one. Yeah? The ions um, of any element, when it reaches that noble gas, is it the same size? Of what is it the, would it be the same size <laughs> as a noble gas? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily, right? Because we're still dealing with charged species, right? A plus and a minus, you know, are going to be different than a neutral one there, right? It's an interesting thought, though, right? How far, how much different would they be? There would have to be a difference, though, right? Because the number of protons is going to be different, right? There actually is a way to calculate these things. A Z effective is what it's called, but you know, it's just one of these formulas that it requires remembering a formula and I don't like it. <laughs> and so here's just kind of the representation for this here to kind of put some numbers together, right? If we're dealing with oxygen, fluorine, and sodium and magnesium there, right? Uh, with the different two minus, right? So an O with a two minus is gonna be bigger than an F with a minus charge, which is going to be bigger than the sodium with a one plus and the magnesium with a two plus, there's going to be a small set of all of those. Okay. So typical questions that come out of these ideas here is I will throw you a list of either neutral elements or a list of ions and say arrange them from greatest to smallest radius, right? Or which of these will have the smallest radius, that kind of thing here, right? So you guys are qualitatively assessing the size of these ions. I don't, I don't remember that, you know, magnesium has an a, a ionic radius of 86 picometers, right? I don't need you guys to know that either. But I do need you guys to be able to explain why it has a smaller radius, right? That's going to be important. All right. So radius is our first important periodic trend. And like I mentioned, it's the one that I'm going to use to explain all the other ones, all right? So for those of you guys who 100% understand, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> you guys will listen to me and then you'll listen. <laughs> right? For those of you guys who 100% understand the idea of atomic radius, then you guys can, you know, kind of stare off at the wall for the next, you know, uh, 30 minutes here or so, okay? Because I'm going to just relate everything back to that, okay? The next periodic trend is this thing called ionization energy, which I mentioned not too long ago. And that is just the energy to remove an electron from the gas phase of an atom. Okay. 
So a couple of unimportant distinctions at the moment, okay? Now, when you guys go to look up the energy values for these, which again are in the back of the book or in the chapter themselves, we are dealing with the gas phase of these atoms, okay? As soon as you put these things into solution or you put them into molecules, this is going to change, whether it increases or decreases that energy, okay? So in the gas phase, this is something that will be true. Now we can use this to predict qualitatively, right, to an extent, what happens when you guys put these into solution or when you guys put them into, the, uh, into a molecule themselves, okay? Now, a couple of quick things here. Now, notice that it's the energy to remove an electron. But we don't have, we don't use minuses when we're writing a chemical equation, right? And what I mean is this. We don't say magnesium as a gas minus an electron goes to make magnesium plus as a gas, okay? You don't see minuses written in equations. So that's why we just take that over to the other side and we say plus an electron there. You guys with me on that? So just one of these conventions that we have for when we are uh, writing our equations. Okay. So it's always plus, it's never minus? Yeah. So if it was you lost an electron, you would switch to the plus, like you'd swap it, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the, well this is showing the loss of an electron here. Okay. Yeah. So the gain of electrons is the reverse, right? This plus this goes to make that. So you just flip the uh, entire equation, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we have a very obscure abbreviation for this. We call the ionization IE. I don't know where that comes from, but there it is, right? And we have a little one subscript. Okay? Now, the one subscript represents the first ionization energy. But you guys already probably figured that out, right? Where's magnesium on the periodic table? Group two, what typically, what charge does it typically have? Plus two, right? So here's the first ionization energy for magnesium to get the magnesium one plus. It should be expected that we have a second ionization energy to get to its kind of happy state as an ion, right? And that would be the second ionization energy, or IE2, right? Or IE3, IE4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Hmm. What's the electron configuration for magnesium? Um, S. But you want the whole right out thing? With the, the whole thing. Man, it's going to take forever. What's the electron configuration for magnesium? Neon S3, no. 3S2, right? So what was it, neon, right? Yeah. 3S2, okay? So I lose an electron. What flavor of electron am I losing? What type of electron am I losing? I Losing one of my S, and we call those our, what are the electrons that are gained or lost? Valence. Our valence electrons, right? You guys with me on this? So I lose my first S electron. Now I'm at neon 3S1. Got it. I lose my second electron. Now I'm just at the electron configuration for neon. What electrons have I just hit, though? When I'm at neon, I don't have any more valence, so I only have my core electrons. Are we going to gain or lose core electrons? No. Not, no. Hmm? Not, usually. Not at all for our sake. Okay. Why? Why would that be? Could you guys explain to me why core electrons are not lost? The answer is? Well, you got to let me read the book first, Dr. H, then I can. <laughs> right? But yeah, Gabe's kind of pointing it in the right direction there. They're very tightly held Right? They're very attracted to the nucleus. Wow. Did you guys follow that? Did you guys know that negatives are attracted to positives? No. No, this is I don't. Of us. We are uh, very good in shadow. Yeah. 
This is why I have you guys sit down when you come to lecture, right? Otherwise, I give this earth-shattering revelation. We just have people faint and run screaming, right? Negatives are attracted to positives. The closer you are to the positive, the more you're attracted to it, right? Does that make sense? You guys, I'm about to ask you a question. That's why I'm, falling, I'm, I'm having you guys kind of step through this, right? So let's ask this, right? So my first ionization energy gets me to magnesium one plus, right? My second ionization energy gets me to magnesium two plus. What, what could we say about the relative size of magnesium one plus versus two plus? It's bigger. What's bigger? What radius of what? The magnesium. Magnesium is bigger than what? Give me a complete. Give me a complete statement. Magnesium one plus is bigger than magnesium two. Plus. Perfect, right? You guys got me on that one, right? Magnesium one plus is bigger than magnesium two plus. The bigger the positive charge, the smaller the radius becomes, right? Which we can relate back to this idea of how strongly the electrons are attracted to the nucleus. Good. Okay. So we started at magnesium, we moved to magnesium one plus. From magnesium one plus, we moved to magnesium two plus. Okay? Now magnesium, you guys would tell me, is larger in radius than one plus and two plus also. Right? Mm -hmm. Which one of these steps to go from here to here or from here to here, right? What could we probably think about this? Well, let's 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 see here for just a second. I lose one electron to get to magnesium one plus. Fair enough. I lose another electron to get to one plus to two plus. What do you think about the relative steps between here and to here? What's going to take more energy? The, the step to magnesium to one plus. Why would you say that? Because we already know that it, it tends to want to go to two plus if it's ionized. So because it's kind of at a happy state. Right. Uh-huh. But since it's stable and it's neutral, it, I, presumably it's like relatively stable and it's in neutral um, it is. elemental form. Mm -hmm. So it would take more energy to convince it to leave that state than to convince it to go from an unstable state to or a, an unstable ionic state to a more stable ionic state. So there's a thought, right? You're like, well, you know, it's kind of happy that it's neutral there. If I just lose one electron, right? We know that it has one plus state doesn't really exist, so we might say that that's a really difficult step. So that's a good thought. What else? Compared to the other cell, um, as it becomes more positive, it would take more energy. Why? Because they're more attracted to each other. Too. Are you saying that negatives are attracted to positives? No. Oh. Yeah. Right. So there's another. There's there's two competing ideas here, right? What, what, uh, what we're thinking here is that, you know, we do have to remove an electron at each step, right? And we do have to kind of hit some of these odd uh, ionic charges in between there. But, right, we also know, right, that there is a happy spot for us to get to. So as we start to lose more and more electrons, right, we'll eventually get to our happy core configuration, right, our noble gas configuration, right? But as we start to lose electrons, each step is probably going to be higher in energy. Because now we have to remove a negative from something that's already plus one. Right? That's going to be even harder to do. Right? And if we have to remove something from something that's plus two, that's going to be even more difficult. And from plus three, it's going to be more difficult. Right? Each iterative loss of an electron is going to be, or at least have a higher energy associated with it. Yeah? Is it? Uh value if it's um, if it needs energy to get the electron out like it's going yeah you always have to add energy into this right so if it was like becoming an anion would it lose energy um is that a thing hang on to that thought I think uh, like I said I think I'll bring this all together at the end so yeah. all right so if we take these ideas and we graph it out then right the larger the atom, the less tightly held is our electron. Now, that's what you guys were just telling me, right? The bigger the radius, that means my students at the back of the classroom can leave a little bit easier. 
right? They're less tightly held to the nucleus, and then they can just kind of leave as they want to, right? The smaller the atom, or the smaller the radius, we should just say, the more tightly they're held, the more energy it takes to remove one of those electrons, right? Down at the bottom here, you see my group one elements, right? Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium. Pretty darn easy to remove those. And up at the top, you see helium and neon and argon and krypton, right? There's our noble gases, right? There's some kind of oddball trends in here, though, isn't there? Right? From nitrogen to oxygen, we actually go down in energy, where we might expect it to go up, right? But we see the same kind of trend here as we go from uh, phosphorus to uh, sulfur, okay? And as we go here from arsenic to selenium, I believe, right? We see that same kind of dip in there. Does that make sense? All right, we see the same kind of dip here as we do here, as we do here, right? Even as we kind of see here. What do we know about the periodic table and how it's arranged? And that's arranged and things in the same family will what? Have similar trends, right? Have similar reactivity, all these kind of things. Remember, the idea of this chapter is periodic trends, right? We should expect to see the same kind of behavior, and that's why we arrange the periodic table in the way that it is. Okay? Good? Yeah. Um, sorry, I still don't understand. Why are those? Oh. The dips are occurring as it jumps from a noble gas to the other side? From, from year to year? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is just, you know, starting with hydrogen all the way through whatever, radon all the way here, right? We're just walking our way through the periodic table. Why did it drop after zinc? Because it's jumping mm. from B block to... It's an interesting yeah. question, right? So this is telling us it's easier to remove this electron than it would be from zinc. Why might that be? Well, what's right after zinc on the PR table? Gallium. Gallium. What's the electron configuration for gallium? Two. Say what? 4s2, right? 3d10, 4p1. One. Oh. Why might it be easy to remove that one electron from gallium then? Yeah, right? We'd have that nice filled orbital set there, right? Everything's kind of full and happy, right? That might be our explanation for that now, right? Remember, I could ask you guys that same question for why might we explain the dip between nitrogen and oxygen there, okay? And then you guys would say, well, what's the electron configuration for nitrogen? You know, I could write that out. What's the electron configuration for oxygen? Why might there be a, or why might we expect to see a dip there, okay? And it's that same kind of approach. You're looking for these half-filled or fully-filled orbitals that kind of thing. Okay. All right. So here's our graphical representation for what we were talking about, right, the different ionization energies. What we do end up seeing is that our first ionization energy, right, from magnesium to magnesium plus, let's say about 750 kilojoules per mole, okay? The next one is about four, you know, about 1,500 kilojoules per mole. And then the third one is massive, close to 8,000. You said we couldn't go past the... It's almost as if I'm about to draw a, a point for this. <laughs> what is this telling us, right? What is this telling us, okay? It takes about 750 kilojoules to remove that first electron. It takes about twice as much energy to remove that second one. Right? And then from here to here, there's a massive increase, about six times more difficult to remove that third electron. What does that tell us then, qualitatively? It's exponential. Hmm? It's exponential. The explanation for what? Exponential. Oh, exponential. Sorry, I thought you said exponential. Mm, yeah, maybe, right? It's pretty unlikely that that would happen. It's unlikely that what would happen? Yeah. Third electron would be removed from magnesium. Why? How, how could we? What could we qualitatively say then? Right? Not too. Not too difficult. Not too difficult. Not going to happen. 
What? What does it It takes a lot of energy because magnesium usually wants two parts, so you're removing a core electron. Perfect. You guys catch that? Got it. Right? When you see a core electron removed, you'll see a massive spike in energy to do that. Right? But you can do it, though. With you can. Electron. It's just not practical, right? You could remove that third electron. It's just we're not going to do it in here. Right? So if you remove a core electron, does like the outer ring of the core electron, does that become a valence electron at that point? Ah, interesting thought. Um, let's see. I guess by definition it would, right? Because now it's no longer a filled orbital. Although to be honest, like I said, I I don't deal with any chemistry that deals with it in that manner here. I would say by definition, just by what we know, I would say yes. But, um, yeah, I don't know, good question. Very good question. What's up? Is the jump from, is the 1450 for magnesium 2 plus, yep. is that the amount of energy needed to take it from? Um, from 1 plus to 2 plus. Okay, so it's not it's not the amount of energy needed to take it um, from the neutral state to 2 plus. It's like. No, no, It's they, these are iterative steps. You have to go from here to here, and then here to here. Yeah, we don't we don't deal with removing two electrons at a time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, one of my favorite questions. So see what you guys come up with. Remember, the idea is to compare the relative changes in energy, right? Or the energy changes relative to each other. Mm. Mm, so remember, these, kind of, these are kind of oddballs here. Right? Yeah. 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 Although, by your reasoning, it could be that also, right? As far as we, you know, if we're just going by the numbers, right? It wouldn't be illogical to make that statement either. what that actually tells you, right? What that actually tells you. So what do we think? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pretty easy for us to lose four of them, right? And then we get the core. Right? So then we say, okay, which ones can we have a plus four state? Right? Good. Good, good, good. No, yeah. So what did we do on the previous slide? So remember what we did is we said that we. Oh, we did. This is the numbers here, yeah? 
that he had accepted him, he just said that one became more difficult to do that. Okay? But once you get four electrons, you can pass it. Okay? So we'll have to give you a copy of each step relative to the one above. Right? So if you take a look at one and two, right, it's about, let's say, 750 to 1500. So it takes about an increase of two. Okay, and between two and three, right, it's about 1500 to 2000. So it's about another increase of two. Right, so go through and relatively compare each one of those. And there should be something that stands out. Okay? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Compare the relative changes in energies with each other. And we can just kind of eyeball this, right? We don't have to, you know, bring out our calculators to do it. So the first ionization energy, let's call it 750, because it makes the math nice and easy, right? So we say about 750 to 1500, okay? So it takes about twice as much, takes about uh, a change in two times the energy here, right? So I just say two for that one. So then between two and three, we're at 1,500 to 3,000. So still about, you know, a change in two there. From three to four, well, there's about a change in, let's say about what, 1.5 or so, right? From four to five, then we see a change of, four. right, a pretty big change. And then from four to, or excuse me, from five to six, we see a change in, I don't know, what, 10-ish, about 20-ish percent or something. Right? So let's say uh, 1.2. Right. So which one of those sticks out? Where's the biggest jump? From 4 to 5. What does that mean here? So now's where the tricky part comes in, or just the piecing ideas together. As we go from 4 to 5, as we lose our fifth electron, what do we hit if we lose our fifth electron? We're removing a core electron. Okay, so if we remove that fifth electron, we're removing a core, which means we have how many valence? Four. So where do we find things with four valence electrons? Things like maybe carbon or silicon, right? That wouldn't be a bad guess. Could we say things like titanium, though? Yeah. Does it have four electrons? Yeah. Good, right? That wouldn't be a bad guess either. I didn't give you all that much information, right? You guys with me on this one? Yeah. So you look at the relative changes and find the biggest spike. The biggest spike corresponds to the uh, removal of a core electron. Okay? If you remove that core electron, you have a huge increase in energy that's required. What's up? So after you make the big jump, the energy it takes to take out another electron decreases yeah. back to where it was. So could you keep going? You could. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 19,000 kilojoules per mole is nothing to sneeze at, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> what's up? What would happen if you removed all of the electrons? The world would end. Well, isn't that like an alpha particle or something? Sure, that sounds good. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not a physicist. <laughs> alpha particles, though, are, are part of radio or radioactive decay. I believe they are a helium, a helium nucleus decay, which is just two protons basically leaving. But if I remember, I forget what all those are. Or the al one of them is the electrons leaving, the other one is a, uh, the nucleus leaving. I forget which one's which. Alpha but when you say the world would end. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. You would just make a highly, highly reactive and charged species, is what it is. That's so, so boom? No, it would just take a tremendous amount of energy and it would probably react with whatever is around it. Right? If it would even be feasible, I doubt it, right, is what it is. 
I doubt you could make like a you know a six plus carbon or something like that. Right? What's up? At what point, like if you remove all of the electrons from something, is that really itself anymore, or is it just something completely different? That sounds like a great question for one of our philosopher professors here. <laughs> what does it mean to be right? <laughs> Are you defined in the a philosophy major doctor? You can't help it. In in the definition of chemistry, we define things by the number of protons that they have, right? So a carbon, whether it's one plus or six plus, would still be a carbon, right? Now it would behave differently, very differently, right? But it would still be by definition for us a carbon. All right, and so here's just kind of some numbers and some trends with this kind of stuff. And you guys see the changes that spike here as we go through the ionization energies, right? So just kind of a visualization of these problems. Not that I expect you guys obviously to, to know any of those, right? I do expect you guys to be able to do this at the top, right? The electron configuration. That would be something I expect you guys to do, right? All right. So now that we've hammered to death the idea of ionization energy, we'll go in the other direction. Now instead of removing electrons, now we'll add electrons, okay? So now we're starting to make anions, right? So we take our neutral plus an electron to make an anion, okay? And we call this electron affinity. Now, hang on a second. So where I'm going to relate this is to the idea of um, uh, uh, electronegativity. Now we have to be careful, okay? Because textbooks, uh, some of these online videos, some of this stuff, right? They just conflate these two. Technically, electron affinity is not the same as electronegativity. Electron affinity is in the gas state as a lone atom, okay? Electronegativity, which we'll get to in just a little bit, Okay, that's when an atom is in a molecule right bound to something else. Now we will see that they're closely related to each other and that's why we see that they're often just interchangeably stated, but there technically is a difference. Do I really care? Not really, okay? Because in both cases we're just saying how attractive is a certain atom to the electrons, okay? That's all we're really gonna be talking about. These tend to be usually exothermic that's interesting, right? There are some exceptions to this, okay? Electron affinity increases as we go from left to right, okay? The energy released. So um, just at the bottom here, just pay attention to what it is. There's just some conventions that go along with this, whether it's negative or positive. I really don't know why they do that. I don't have a good explanation for it, but just so you guys are aware. You know, this point on top here is, is, is the idea to kind of follow along with that. Metals have a low electron affinity. Non-metals have high electron affinity. Now, you guys already knew that, though, right? It was way back when life was easier, at the beginning of the semester. When we were first introducing the idea of the periodic table, we said metals tend to form cannon and non-metals tend to form anions, okay? So here's finally our explanation for that, or one of our explanations for that. Metals have a low electron affinity. They want to lose, they'd rather lose electrons. Non-metals have a high electron affinity. They'd rather gain electrons. Yeah? Why, why is it gas phase specifically? Is it easier? Because as soon as you put stuff around it, it's gonna change this. Right, if you put solvent around this, you put other fluorine atoms nearby, you put other different elements nearby, it's gonna change it. Things start to deform, the orbitals change a little bit, all these kind of things. So, so gas phase is assuming like an isolated system? Yeah, that's basically it, right? Okay. When we say something in the gas phase, there's really nothing nearby that's gonna affect anything, okay. right? Thank you. That is a contrivance in a way though, right? There obviously might be some influence, but the definition of a gas is that the particles are basically spread out. Right. And so we that's why we have to do it in this case. So here's kind of some numerical values with this. Um, I don't know, I couldn't find a good graphical representation for it. But electron affinity increases as we go from left 
to right. Okay, as we go from left to right. So we'll see that the elements themselves become more attractive to electrons. But you guys already knew that, didn't you? Because how's everything related? Not by the noble gases, by what? Size. Radius, right? Everything in this chapter is related by radius. If I have a really small radius, and I'm adding an electron, what does that mean? The electron can get what? A really small radius. It can get nice and close to the nucleus. Where do electrons want to be? Nice and close to the nucleus. You guys with me on this? The smaller the radius, the closer the nucleus that incoming electron can get. The closer the nucleus, the happier it is. Got it? So if you remember back to the Skittles periodic table that I showed you, what has a really, 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 really small radius? Fluorine. Fluorine does. So what do we expect about fluorine? It would have a very, very high electron affinity, right? It would have a very high electron affinity. Electrons really want to get together with fluorine there, okay? And we'll see that when we start to talk about electron, electron negativity also. Okay? Yep. On your graphic up there, why does yep. fluorine have like 349.0, but like fluorine has like 328, and there's no 0.0 for it? Okay. You, seriously, you're busting me on a sick fix here. No, I'm not. <laughs> 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 what are those numbers for? Because they're electron <laughs> affinity. Oh. Yeah. So, okay. So, here. Yeah, yeah, there's some oddballs that happen in there. So, like, the alkali earth metals, they all have zero. And then yeah. all the noble gases, they all have zero. Yeah. So, what does that tell you? They really don't want to add electrons to them, right? Interesting. Yep. What, is, what about oh. neodymium? Okay. Yep. Well, okay, so hang on. All right, so that would be a good place to stop for today. <laughs> I will see you guys on Wednesday then. We'll finish up 7 and we'll move into 8 and 9. Okay? Yes, we have five minutes. Why do we want it? Why is it? That's the question. Right?